Today, we're diving into some super interesting parts of Chinese history. Big shout out to Hathmas from the Spanish channel for the heads up and all the help. Definitely check out the channel if you want to watch our videos in Spanish. Also, gotta thank KD for laying down the foundation for all of this. So yeah, let's jump right into it. I thought it'd be cool to start a series exploring the mysterious side of China, like Tartaria, history hijacks, and lost history. This is some pretty wild stuff we're about to jump into, and it's tough to find the perfect starting point. But what if I told you there was a world war before World War I? It's not something we're taught in school or it's not really widely known about. Apparently, there was an international conflict involving a secret society of kung fu fighters, which at the time was referred to as Chinese boxing. This is known as the Boxer Rebellion. The whole story is pretty crazy. It starts with a small group of villagers who decided to take on foreign affairs into their own hands without any weapons. Their main practice was a type of spiritual possession involving incantations to deities and violent prostrations. They claimed supernatural invulnerability against cannons, rifles, and knife attacks. This group gained popularity and claimed that millions of soldiers would descend from heaven to assist them in eliminating the foreigners. What's even stranger is that an entire eight-nation alliance was needed to quell this rebellion, with even the United States getting involved. It begs the question of why was it so important to intervene in a rebellion aimed at reviving the true Qing dynasty? This secret society sparked an uprising due to the growing influence of foreign spheres in China, leading Western powers in Japan to team up against this rebellion. What's crazy is that the Eight Nation Alliance brought 20,000 armed troops into China for this, and it supposedly took months to finally end the rebellion. Not sure if it was just eight nations. Here's a photo where we can spot Australia and India, and possibly Russia was also involved but missing from the group photo, hinting that maybe more countries were involved in this event than officially listed. While the story goes that the boxers decided to kill a bunch of Christians and foreigners, even deciding to burn some churches, and so the entire world needed to step in to rescue these people getting killed by these kung fu fighters. But remember, we only know the victor's side of the story. What's fascinating is seeing Americans, Japanese, and Germans banding together against the rebellion. In one of the main events, the Siege of the International Legations, which unfolded in Tartar City, which is essentially the inner walled city of Beijing, back then called Peking, Tartar City. Designated for the Manchus, the Qing Dynasty's ruling class, and the imperial family. It was encircled by this massive Tartar wall. The massive wall ringed the entire city of Beijing, stretching a total of 37 miles, was built in the 1400s during the Ming Dynasty. There are these old photos that reveal its grand scale in a style that doesn't quite align with traditional Chinese architecture. We can talk more about that soon, but this siege was essentially the whole world teaming up, which is really crazy for its time. A bunch of people who were enemies all teamed up and basically created an international police force for the first time in order to put a stop to these Chinese boxing peasants that believed they were impervious to bullets. But why were they such a threat to the powers that be? Why send so many nations in? Perhaps this has something to do with the Qing Dynasty which had been in power since the 1640s. The Boxer War was brutal, with mainstream estimates up to 100,000 deaths among the Boxers and Chinese civilians. Many were killed in battles, but there were also these horrifying executions that defy any notion of civility. Of course the story is that these Boxers were killing Christians and foreigners, but these executions were horrible where their heads were removed and then they have like these postcards and photos of this stuff as a way to show off. I'm not going to go too deep into that, but it's just strange because these people were tortured in medieval types of ways in the early 1900s and this was to appease foreign powers. Whatever happened, it seems that there's more to this story. 
who was behind the Qing dynasty, and what forces were they up against. This conflict spanned nearly two years, suggesting the Eight Nation Alliance weren't just facing simple kung fu farmers. Could the Ku Cheng massacre have been a pretext, a false flag to justify foreign intervention against supposed anti-Christian rebels in China? However, there is another aspect to this that we should consider that doesn't normally get brought up with the Boxer Rebellion. It wasn't just the Boxers, there were also Muslim armies involved. Quote, the Gansu Braves, or Gansu Army, was a unit of 10,000 Chinese Muslim troops from the northwestern province of Gansu in the last decades of the Qing Dynasty. Loyal to the Qing, the Braves were recruited in 1895 to suppress a Muslim revolt in Gansu. Under the command of General Dong Fusheng, they were transferred to the Beijing metropolitan area in 1898 where they officially became the rear division of the Wu Wei Corps, a modern army that protected the imperial capital. The Braves, who wore traditional uniforms but were armed with modern rifles and artillery, played an important role in the 1900s during the Boxer Rebellion. After helping to repel the Seymour Expedition, a multinational foreign force sent from Tianjin to relieve the Beijing Legation Quarter in early June, the Muslim troops were the fiercest attackers during the siege of the legations from 20th of June to the 14th of August. They suffered heavy casualties at the Battle of Peking, in which the Eight Nation Alliance relieved the siege. End quote. This shed some light on how they managed to hold their ground against foreign powers. They had rallied an actual army, including armed Muslims in defense of the Qing dynasty. The numbers might have been greater than officially acknowledged, too. Furthermore, the Manchurian language and their script looks very similar to Arabic. This is supposedly because both scripts are descendants of Aramaic, so there does seem to be a historical connection. Now there are many layers to this, but let's rewind a bit and talk about the Qing Dynasty. This is the last imperial dynasty of China established in 1636 and it was founded by the Manchus after they conquered the previous Ming Dynasty. Now this is all according to mainstream narrative and timelines, but the Qing Dynasty didn't get a flag until the late 19th century, which is a blue dragon on a yellow flag. But what was their flag before this? Tartaria also happens to be a yellow flag. Let's keep in mind that Tartary was still on maps in this area up until the 1800s, so was the Qing dynasty perhaps connected with the Tartarians in some way? Interestingly, there are some Jesuit accounts of this Manchu takeover of the Ming dynasty. This was called the Tartar War. In Martino Martini's De Bejo Tartarico, or about the Tartar War, there's a depiction given as the front piece of the book. This engraving shows the conflict between the Manchus and the native Chinese. Well, for one, the Manchu warrior is depicted as a European, and this was not just artist error, as Martini says that the Manchus were not barbarians, they were more human, meaning more European than Chinese. What's also interesting is that the Jesuits during this time referred to the Manchus as Tartars, hence the Tartar War. But let's look at this Manchu warrior again. Now take notice, he's holding what seems to be a head of a Chinese person. But apparently historians have noted that the haircut, or what is supposed to be a Manchu queue, looks more like a Cossack's hair. The Manchu hairstyle or queue was a specifically male hairstyle worn by the Manchu from central Manchuria and later imposed on the Han Chinese during the Qing dynasty. The hair on the front of the head was shaved off above the temples every 10 days and the remainder of the hair was braided into a long braid. We'll talk more about that in another episode, but in this depiction from the Jesuits, the hairstyle looks more like a Cossack's hairstyle which is also related to the Polish half-shaven head. The Ukrainian chub, or Cossack haircut, is very similar to the Manchu haircut. Historians say that this is an inconsistency in the picture, but it does kind of look like the Cossack's haircut which would be interesting because the Cossacks are pretty much the descendants of the Vikings. 
It's also important to note that maps from the 1600s and before show Tartaria with a label under it that says Ancient Scythia. The ancient Greeks called it Great Scythia, which referred to all the lands northeast of Europe. This area covered a large portion of China. In mainstream history, it's much smaller in size, but in older maps, the size varies throughout Central Asia to the border of China. Look at this Ortelius map from 1572. We see Tartaria reaching to the border, and the text says, Tartaria, which includes Asian Sarmatia and both the ancient Scythias. Now in the mainstream story, Tartary is supposed to be just a landmass with a bunch of illiterate tent dwellers. However, let's dive into that because some of these maps are very interesting. First off, look at the buildings that don't look to be tents, but kingdoms. And specifically this one over here, as we'll discuss shortly. For example, how could there be an emperor or king of Tartaria? Look at this massive tent here, and the text says, Great Khan, which in the language of the Tartars, sounds, means, emperor, the greatest prince of Asia. So wait, the Khans are the Tartars, it's the Tartar word for emperor. This gets into Marco Polo, and we can break this down more fully in future videos as there are many interesting things from his travels, but specifically focusing on his trip to China, some things don't really add up with this whole narrative. There are even historians who doubt that he visited China because there are many things he didn't feel the need to mention. Like he doesn't mention the Great Wall of China, doesn't mention tea, foot binding, nor does he even discuss the Chinese script. Which sure, mainstream scholars will choose what they want to use and scrap what doesn't work for the official narrative. However, this is the first traveler's account of the East to the European world, and this was during the late 13th century. Which is strange because the Wall of China is depicted on the Urbano Monte map. Interesting that Marco Polo has a depiction of himself wearing a tartar outfit with the owl, and also Let's keep in mind that China during this time was called Cathay. Marco Polo started his journey in the 1200s and met with Kublai Khan, yet what if we're not being told the full story? Kublai Khan is depicted as a Mongol in the modern day, however, there is an older depiction from the Marco Polo book that shows the Khan of Cathay. Hmm, doesn't look like the same people. Also notice the style of hats looks to be the same as ancient Jewish priest. This isn't the only one. There are descriptions of Kublai Khan's court, and it's the same thing. Marco Polo described great parties hosted by Kublai Khan with as many as 40,000 guests. He reported that Khan once received a gift of more than a thousand white horses, very beautiful and fine, and employed 10,000 falconers, carrying jur falcons, peregrines, sake falcons, and ghost shocks, and 20,000 dog handlers. He also had an unstated number of lions, leopards, and lynxes to go after wild boars and other big animals, and 5,000 elephants all covered with beautiful clothes. He wrote that Kublai Khan's palace contained a dining area that could seat 6,000 and was surrounded by a four mile wall. But these numbers are thought to be exaggerations. So anytime there's something that doesn't fit the mainstream narrative, is an exaggeration. Yet, Marco Polo swore that he was telling the truth and that he couldn't even fit everything into his accounts. He said that if he were trying to explain everything that he encountered, most people wouldn't believe it. Take a look at this. Now this is from a 1659 book titled The History of the World, and there's a description of Cathay or Cathaya. Quote, Cathaya which was of old called Scythia, without the mountain Imam, as Zagatea, Scythia, within Amas, took its name from the Cathy, whom Strabo here placeth, and hath for bounds, China on the south, the Scythic Sea on the north, lying also eastward from the Tartarian provinces. The Saras were thought anciently to inhabit here, who being very expert in weaving silks made a fine wool on the leaves of trees, 
caused silk to be called in Latin, serica. The Cathians and Zagatians are the noblest and civilest among the Tartars, and lovers of all arts. Herein are diverse fair cities, whereof Kambala, 28 miles about, besides the suburbs as some say, is the chief. Here the great Cham, Khan, resides. But in Shandu, he hath a palace almost of incredible largeness and stateliness. The first of the great Chams or Khan or emperors of Tartary was Singis or Zingis in 1162, who subduing Un Cham, Un Khan, the last king of Tenduk and Cathaya, changed the name of Scythia into Tartaria. End quote. So there you go. It's talking about massive cities. Scythia was converted into Tartaria, which was done by a great Khan or emperor of Cathay. And this was King Zingis? Very close to Genghis Khan, which is not the exact dates we're given, but we need to consider there may be some alterations in our timeline here. Also, Genghis has many different depictions. However, it is said that he had red hair and blue or gray eyes. Kind of interesting to consider as we continue to connect all of this. There are also the Li Qian people who are described as Chinese Romans who inhabited the Yunnan province. Their features are more European compared to the Han Chinese. However, apparently according to the wiki, the theory that they came from the Roman soldiers has been debunked, but it is interesting to consider. Did Marco Polo really go into China during the late 1200s? Or maybe Marco Polo went in the 1600s and were given a distorted timeline. So if we take into consideration that the timeline has added ghost years, what if Marco Polo is really telling us about things in the 15th or 16th century, and the Khan that he was working for was really the Tartars or the Qing dynasty? So Manchu, Qing, and Tartar seem to be referencing the same thing here. But let's keep diving deeper as it just keeps getting crazier. Okay, so Cathay, or China, was once ancient Scythia. And we know that Scythia was eventually changed to Tartaria. One story that may connect with all of this is the Queen of Scythia. Tomaris is a queen that was mentioned by Herodotus and she was the ruler of this ancient Tartaria. She is depicted as being fair-skinned with red or blonde hair, and there's this whole story about how she had to defend her nation from an attack by Cyrus the Great, where she defeated him and severed his head. This was quite popular during Renaissance art, and would typically be depicted receiving the head of Cyrus. Now there is one depiction that's intriguing. There is a tapestry from the early 1500s showing Cyrus proposing to Queen Tomaris, and she is rejecting him. However, there are some very fascinating aspects of this depiction. For one, there are Celtic designs on her dress. They don't seem to be nomads or tent dwellers, and yet look at this pillar right behind her. But even more surprising is that in the background, we see a detail of her city. So wait. This is what a Scythian city is supposed to look like? Those are skyscrapers in the background. But of course, we'll just be told the artist imagined these things. Another interesting detail that we can talk more about in a moment is look at this lion right here, which looks just like the Chinese lion. We will see the same decorations as we continue, but I thought that was worthy to note because this is quite common in Chinese culture as well. In a universal history from the earliest accounts to the present time from 1779, there is an account of the Scythian queen. Tomaris, Tomaris, or Tamaris, was the heroine whom we are told Cyrus the Great demanded in marriage. But she, supporting that her kingdom, rather than her person, was the object of his wishes, sent express orders to his ambassadors not to proceed. Cyrus provoked, either at her refusal or at her suspecting his artifice, advanced with his army against the Masagatis, who were under her dominion. 
So it wasn't her love that he wanted, he wanted her city. Meaning, it obviously was a very impressive city and not just a bunch of tents, and this is referenced during the time of Herodotus. But this could actually be much closer in time than we're led to believe. Here is a depiction of Cyrus taking over another king and city, but look at the flags. These are coat of arms and the exact same lion in that same position was the coat of arms for Tomaris. So is Cyrus taking over her city? Look at the architecture in the background, that's quite impressive. Is it possible that there were nations, cities, massive amounts of architecture in this part of China or Tartaria, ancient Scythia? Well, let's go back to that map that we were looking at earlier. There's another detail I need to bring up. If we come up to the Bering Strait, we see a couple of interesting paragraphs. One is Arsareth, and the other is Argon. This is what the text says for Arsareth. Arsareth. Here, the ten tribes separated, and in the place of the Tatars, Tartars, they established themselves in the Scythian manner. Hence, they are called Gothi or Gothe to be honored from the highest glory of God. And from this place, the kingdom became famous as Cathay. Well, hold up. The lost tribes of Israel ended up in this area? Do they have something to do with Tartaria? They established themselves in the Scythian manner and are called Gothe which seems to have Celtic roots. But let's continue. Argon says this, Once there was in Asia a Christian kingdom known to Prester John and D. Thomas founded it in this place, so that it was in contact with the Church of Rome, and was subjected to Rome through Prester John of Africa, before it was defeated by the Goths. It was known as Criu Ramoye. Not exactly sure how to pronounce that, but there was a Christian kingdom up in this area. And there's this whole thing about whether Prester John was the king of Ethiopia or Asia, as there is a depiction of Prester John being a chief of a Christian tribe, so they say, in Tartary or Tartaria. However, in other depictions, he seems to be depicted as black, which would be interesting considering the connection to Spain and Aragon. Apparently on this map, it's saying that a D. Thomas came and found this land for Prester John who was obedient to the Church of Rome. This Argon used to be known as Criu Rimoe. There are a lot of connections to be made, as Argon etymologically speaking would seem to be Celtic in origin. The Argonauts were searching for the Golden Fleece as they made their way east, trying to discover some type of advanced sacred object. There is also Aragon in Spain, which was originally founded by the Celts, but interestingly, this area is also written as Aragon in some maps. Herodotus makes mention to a King Argonthonios who ruled Tartessos for 80 years, from about 625 BC to 545 BC, and lived to be 120 years old, although some believe he lived to 150. Tartessos is in southern Spain but an interesting connection, and the word Argonthonios appears to be based on the Indo-European word for silver, secondarily money, reconstructed as Proto-Celtic Arganto and Proto-Italic as Argentum. There could have been groups of Moors in this region, which would explain the Arabic influence in Chinese Muslims. So Argon could be a reference to a land filled with resources, and apparently, Argon was once known as Creu Remoe, which was in the Manchurian region. This city was named after Rome, so Romans were in China? Now keep in mind, it's not the Rome that we officially have been told in mainstream history. However, it would seem the same people who helped establish Rome made their way to establish kingdoms in the Far East. There is another name on here that is curious, that... We'll have to go into more in detail on another part of the series, but for now, it'll be good to mention that there's also Ania, and the Bering Strait used to be called the Streto de Anian. 
This is significant because it would seem that this Ania kingdom had crossed the Bering Strait and set up kingdoms in America, known as the Anian Kingdom. There are full-on kingdoms in America during a time that they shouldn't be there. And it's even mentioned that these people lived like the Tartars, or were the Tartarians. So the Anian Regnum, or Kingdom, was somewhere in British Columbia. It's fascinating to think that these kingdoms in Asia, or Tartaria, made their way to America before Columbus, according to many of these maps. That sure would be an easier journey, and they could have been doing that for centuries before the West even knew about the New World. Let's look at the Fra Moro map, which gives an entirely different picture of what Asia looked like in the 1460s. Not only is the map drawn upside down, which makes it confusing, but Tartaria is depicted in most of the impressive architecture is on the far east, right where it says Chatao, which I'm assuming is another version of Cathay or Cathaya, so China. But look at this architecture. This isn't the same type of buildings that they use throughout the entire map because if you look at Europe, there's no comparison. The buildings in the Far East are massive as if there was an advanced civilization in this area during this time. And these depictions match with the descriptions given to us by Marco Polo. Also, in Urbano Monte's map, we see Katiao mentioned. And it's curious to consider is Cathay a reference to the Cathars being in China? Obviously, the story we're told is that they were limited to Western Europe. But when you really break down their ideology, it's possible that they are perhaps an older form of Christianity. They did believe that the Catholic Church was a hijacked satanic religion. Interestingly, the story is that Catharism has its origin in Manichaeism, which was a similar ideology of dualism, but older and present in the East. Perhaps the story is backwards, and this ideology, or older version of Christianity, made its way into China and was actually quite prevalent. We can discuss that more in a future video, but thought it would be interesting to mention. However, let's look back at the map and discuss the architecture. I believe that there were massive amounts of kingdoms and buildings in this area, and this was around the 15th century, not thousands of years ago. Then we're fed a completely messed up history in which all of this was erased, and one of the interesting pieces of evidence that support this has to do with the lost city. Well, it's not necessarily lost, but it most likely has been renamed or moved around. First off, why are maps even mentioning Scythia if it supposedly ended around 100 BC? It doesn't really make sense to include ancient kingdoms on contemporary maps, so maybe Scythia is from a more recent time. Let's keep in mind that Marco Polo was working with the Jesuits. Maybe there's some information that's not being fully told to us, but there is an account from Marco Polo during his travels to China where he describes his favorite city. In his travels, this city is called Kinze, but on maps you'll see it spelled as Quinze or Quinsai, and this was the city of heaven according to the book. Quote, and since we have got thither, I will enter into particulars about its magnificence, and these are well worth the telling. For the city is beyond dispute the finest and noblest in the world. In this we shall speak according to the written statement which the queen of this realm sent to Bayan the conqueror of the country for transmission to the great Khan, in order that he might be aware of the surpassing grandeur of the city and might be moved to save it from destruction or injury. I will tell you all the truth as it was set down in that document, for truth it was, as the said messenger Marco Polo at a later date was able to witness with his own eyes. And now, we shall rehearse those particulars." End quote. So a queen had written to the Khan to describe the beauty of the city so that he would be determined to come and save it from destruction. And as Marco Polo was working for the Khan, he was sent to investigate the city. It literally even says that Marco Polo saw it with his eyes and that everything he's saying is truth. But this is where it gets crazy, because historians just can't accept that this description is possible because it's just so insane, so they just say he's exaggerating. 
But I really wonder why? Why would he want to exaggerate when his whole purpose was to explore these lands and relay this to the West? Why would he be saying that there is no other city in the world that even comes close to Kinzei's magnificence? Now listen to this. So this city was 100 miles in circumference, and it had 12,000 bridges of stone. Yes, 12,000. And they were so large that a great fleet could pass beneath them. Not just that, Marco Polo says, if the bridges are not impressive enough, the entire city stands as if it were on the water and surrounded by water. Wait, hold on. This is literally a floating city like Tenochtitlan? Which we can make some more connection to in a moment. But this is the Chinese version of that, and they even have some 1600s depictions of Quinzei that are really interesting. This doesn't look like a Chinese city. Look at the obelisk and the massive buildings. It's on a star fort with many different pools and waterways throughout the city, which would make more sense with the claim that there were over 10,000 bridges. Let's keep in mind that the mainstream narrative says that Quinzei is modern day Hangzhou in China, but I'm not so sure if that's the case. Hangzhou is located much more south, but in older maps you can see that Quinzei was more above Japan near the Anian Strait. Did they move the location of the city in order to cover up this history as it didn't align with the narrative they wanted for China? There's more to his description and it's quite detailed. Quote, Inside the city there's a lake which has a compass of some 30 miles. And all around it are erected beautiful palaces and mansions of the richest and most exquisite structure that you can imagine, belonging to the nobles of the city. There are also on its shores many abbeys and churches of the idolaters. In the middle of the lake are two islands, on each of which stands a rich, beautiful, and spacious edifice, furnished in such style as to seem fit for the palace of an emperor. Know also that the great Khan hath distributed the territory of Manzi into nine parts, which he hath constituted into nine kingdoms. To each of these kingdoms a king is appointed, who is subordinate to the great Khan, and every year renders the accounts of his kingdom to the fiscal office of the capital. The city of Kinzei is the seat of one of these kings, who rules over 140 great and wealthy cities. For in the whole of this vast country of Manzi, there are more than 1,200 great and wealthy cities, without counting the towns and villages, which are in great numbers." End quote. So according to this description, this was an operation, and they had hundreds of cities in this region that were comparable in wealth, which is quite shocking to think about. But that lines up with the Fra Moro map and all the architecture that we see in the east. There is also this description of Shi Mian, which I found to be interesting. Apparently this is supposed to be somewhere in Burma. This doesn't seem to be an exaggeration either, as there are many of these temples and pagodas still standing today. Apparently at one time there was over 10,000 of these in this area, but now only 2,000 remain. The interesting thing about the connection between Quinzei and Tenochtitlan is the dragon. Quetzalcoatl was the most revered god of Mesoamerica, depicted as a feathered serpent. Is it just a coincidence that China also reveres the dragon? Also, the Han people do consider themselves to be the descendants of the dragon, which was also the Qing Dynasty's flag from 1889, a dragon seemingly swallowing a red sun, and Quetzalcoatl is depicted swallowing a man. This also connects with the Bichonne, or Vipera, which is basically a coat of arms logo for elite Italian families. But I just find it interesting that we see the same symbol repeated. Also, Quetzalcoatl was also described as being white and bearded. Perhaps there were Christian groups or even the lost tribes of Israel that had separated and made their way to the far east, eventually crossing the Anian Strait establishing the Anian Kingdom and making their way down to the south. Another interesting thing to consider is the mention of Serica on these old maps. On the Ortelius and Moro maps, we see a reference to Serica in the Serica Sea or Sericus, which 
is around the area where Quincey would be. I also didn't mention it, but you can see Quincey on the Fra Morio map as Chansey, and it looks pretty massive on here too. This is on the Serica wiki page, but it kind of connects with all this. Quote, Pliny also reports a curious description of the Ceres made by an embassy from Taprobani to Emperor Claudius, suggesting they may be referring to the Indo-European populations of the Tarim Basin, such as the Tuckerians. They also informed us that the side of their island which lies opposite to India is 10,000 stadia in length and runs in a southeasterly direction that beyond the Modian mountains, Himalayas, they looked towards the Servi, Ceres, whose acquaintance they had also made in the pursuits of commerce, that the father of Rachius, the ambassador, had frequently visited their country, and that the Sere always came to meet them on their arrival. These people, they said, exceeded the ordinary human height, had flaxen hair and blue eyes, and made an uncouth sort of noise by way of talking, having no language of their own for the purpose of communicating their thoughts." End quote. So the people in this area of the Tarim Basin could possibly be the Tocharians. They were an Indo-European culture that had settled in this area thousands of years ago according to mainstream timelines. Here is a depiction of a royal family in the Fair-Haired Princes. The Terran Basin is also home to the Terran mummies that were well preserved and feature Caucasoid features such as with the Lulan beauty. A genetic study of remains from the oldest layer of the Shaohe Cemetery found that the maternal lineages were a mixture of East and West Eurasian types, while all the paternal lineages were of West Eurasian type. It is unknown whether they are connected with the frescoes painted at Tocharian sites more than two millennia later which also depict light eyes and hair color. Quote, the mummies were found with plaid woven tapestries that are notably similar to the weaving pattern of the tartan style of the Hallstatt culture of Central Europe, associated with Celts. The wool used in the tapestries was found to come from sheep with European ancestry. End quote. Also, there is the Churchin Man, which is another Terran mummy that features Caucasian features. His hair was reddish brown flecked with gray, framing high cheekbones. He had an aquiline long nose, full lips, and a ginger beard, and was wearing a red twill tunic and leggings with a pattern resembling tartan. He was buried in a tomb made of mud bricks, and there's also his wife that's extremely well preserved, which is kind of insane because they're saying this is from 1000 BC. The interesting thing about this is that the Manchus are descendants of the Jurchin people, which I believe it's pronounced Churchin, but it's spelled with a J, which is interesting if we connect that to the Churchin man. Okay, so let's finish off with bridges and then we'll continue with some more crazy stuff in part two. Now remember, Marco Polo was saying there were some very impressive bridges in China, and I was looking into ancient bridges and found a couple of interest. One is literally called the Marco Polo Bridge and was constructed in the 12th century, but I started to notice there were some inconsistencies with the depictions. This bridge was mentioned and described by Marco Polo, and we even have a painting of what this originally looked like. Marco Polo describes it as being made with fine marble. At the beginning of the bridge was a fine marble column and under it a marble lion. Now supposedly the one that stands today is not the same one and was rebuilt in the late 1600s. But I just thought that was interesting that there are bridges that are no longer there or don't look anything like the modern one that they claim it to be. This particularly became apparent when looking into the Opium Wars. There's this one battle called the Battle of Palikau or Palikao, which means the Battle of the Eight Mile Bridge. It was a battle on this massive bridge. According to the engraving of the battle, I mean, look how massive this thing is. They could fight a battle on here with cannons, and it looks like there's tens of thousands of people depicted on this bridge. 
However, this bridge is in Beijing and it's called the Balachao Bridge. But if you look at the bridge that they claim to be this 8 mile bridge, it looks nothing like the original engraving from 1860. In fact, I doubt you could really fight a battle on this bridge as it looks too small. Yet they say that the 8 miles is a reference to the bridge being 8 Chinese miles from a certain district. It's almost as if this is a cover story because they have a photo from 1860. So how do you take a photo of this bridge in 1860 and then release an engraving during the same time depicting it in a completely different fashion? 30,000 soldiers were fighting on this bridge? And why are the lions so much smaller than in the engraving? But of course, it's just the artist's imagination. 8 miles would be a massive feat, which sounds insane, but remember what Marco Polo was saying about the bridges in Quincy. He said that there were tens of thousands and that they were massive, allowing fleets to pass under. That makes more sense when we look at the engraving of the battle, Perhaps there were bridges and features of architecture in China that the powers that be don't want us to know about. There is the Luoyang Bridge, which is said to be the first stone bridge in China. But it is pretty massive to be the first time to attempt such a thing. It's almost a mile long, and it's over a thousand years old. However, if we're to consider Marco Polo's account of China, he makes mention of highly sophisticated engineering involving fine stone and decorated with precious metals. Was Marco Polo really an explorer? Perhaps that's just the cover. And he really was a spy trying to learn as much as possible for the Pope. This involved military strategies. Which is pretty crazy, did you know that the Chinese had a repeating crossbow that dates to 400 BC? They had a repeating crossbow which would allow them to shoot continuously, and Marco Polo does mention a lot of these weapons. But the craziest thing is that supposedly, Marco Polo actually made it to North America. A sheepskin map believed to be a copy of the 13th century Italian explorers may indicate that Marco Polo came upon modern day Alaska and Washington during his travels around Asia. This would mean that either Marco Polo went there in the 13th century and gave this information to the Venetians, or he got this information from the Chinese or Arabs. What's interesting is that they dated the sheepskin to the 16th century, which would make sense if we consider that perhaps there's some phantom time occurring and Marco Polo's travels actually occurred in the 1500s after some type of reset event. We'll discuss this further in part two, but let us know if you enjoyed the video and if there's anything else you think is connected that we should look into further. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Also, I'm not claiming to know all the answers or be an expert on Chinese history. Just being curious and asking questions, really. There's so much more to get into on this, so multiple parts are coming. And if you guys could leave your thoughts, like the video, and share the video with your friends, it'd be greatly appreciated. Thanks for watching, and all we can hope is that our minds may be unveiled. Let go of everything you think to be true. Relax the mind and ask the question, do I truly understand what this reality is?